time, weather, and... everyone. Good that was pretty good. Mackenzie had already gotten on to you a couple of times. Just check and see your pulse. Make sure everybody's doing well. We are starting a new series called Christmas at the Movies. I'm very excited. Today we're, that lady right there is excited. The rest of you are like, I'm going to hold my applause till the end. We'll see how this goes. I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, so we're going to be watching clips from Home Alone. All right. So this is a classic. How many of you have never seen Home Alone? Yeah, I'm going to ruin it for you today. I'm sorry. You're going to watch pretty much all of it, know the ending. It's going to be good. But at least it'll give you something to go back and watch. The reason we do this, the reason we do uh, something like this is because I want you, because during the holidays, my family, we love to watch Christmas movies, you know? And what I've, what I've learned to realize is that sometimes during Christmas, many times you can get going so fast and, and making all the plans and arranging all the things that sometimes you can actually leave Jesus out of Christmas, right? You can actually get to more. We're just watching movies and having so much fun. You actually forget to implement Jesus into Christmas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject Christmas and in, uh, Jesus into a secular movie that you're probably going to watch so that I can ruin it for you. So when you go back to watch it, you just see Jesus all over it. So we're just going to fix it and just ruin it all for everybody so we can uh, just really think through Jesus while we're watching movies. Now, the fun part is that uh, today's specific piece is going to deal with Forgiveness, it's everybody's favorite topic in church right after giving and tithing, you know? <laughs> it's, it's a great, great thing to talk about. It gets everybody jazzed up, but forgiveness. I wanna talk to you about forgiveness, but not only forgiveness, but learning to re-engage after you forgive. It is so, so important for you to understand that community, relationships, family are vital to everyone in this room. It is so important for you to have real community. But here's what I also know. In community, you get hurt. Can we just acknowledge that? So here's what I want you to grasp is that you need people in your life. And this is the phrase I'm gonna come back to by the time we end this message, which is this. Forgiveness does not cure dysfunction. But it gives you a chance to re-engage. Right? How many times have you gotten into a moment where you got upset, got mad, got frustrated with somebody, and you were unable to forgive, and it kept you from actually having real community, whether with a family member, a friend, a coworker, maybe your own church. Now, before you go and try to explain to me how your family is so dysfunctional, no amount of forgiveness is ever gonna cure it, I wanna walk you through a few things so that we understand we're all on the same page. Number one is this. Healthy families and community is something that we all need and desire. Maybe not desire. Some of you, maybe you're like, Mm-mm, maybe I just need it, not necessarily desire yet. I'll, maybe we'll get there, okay? Number two, though, you can't control what other people do, say, or behave. Can I get a hearty amen? Eyes on me, eyes on me. Sometimes the first service, we had a couple people almost get in trouble and lose their Christmas present because when they agreed with that, they were looking at their spouse. That's not a good sign. When I ask questions like that, you need to keep eyes right here, okay? Just trying to keep everything healthy. Number three, this means in your families and community, there's always the risk of getting hurt. Amen? When you're in community with people, there's a chance you're gonna get hurt. It goes well beyond a chance. It's about, what, 100%. You're gonna get hurt. People hurt each other. We do silly little things that get on it. How many of you just had Thanksgiving? Yeah, that was a great opportunity for somebody to say something at the dining room table that's gonna hurt somebody. Family's difficult. Here's the other fourth thing. The desire and the need, though, for community didn't go anywhere. We still need each other, and yet we know we can hurt each other. That's a bummer. We hurt each other, yet we still need each other. You ever thought about that? Pain actually hurts relationships, father, sons, mothers, daughters, neighbors, coworkers. I mean, we need each other, even in the church. Now, listen. Spoiler alert, do you know you can get hurt in church? I don't know if y'all knew that. I'm just gonna lay that out there for you. You can actually get hurt in relationships in church. Here's the last thing though. The change in you 
may be actually what needs to happen to see a change in the other person. Sometimes you seeking forgiveness and a chance to re-engage can actually be what the other person needs to just stand a chance to maybe bring something back together. Now, I'm gonna say this a handful of times because I know some of us are a little bit, that's a good word for it. The Biblical says, the Bible says stiff-necked. I'm just gonna say hard-headed, you know? How many of you are hard-headed, right? Like we're Texans, right? Like that's just, we're, that's what we're known for around the world, right? Stubborn, hard-headed, it's great. You ever try to forgive somebody, but the first 10 minutes of it, you're explaining to them what they did wrong to you? <laughs> okay, so we've all been there, all right? Like, okay, I wanna teach you today that that's not the forgiveness that Jesus wants you to do. Where did you know that that shirt you wore last week, bro, really offended me? And the words that you said, oh, oh yeah, but I forgive you. That's not how this works. Forgiveness is actually in you and gives you the ability now to get back into a relationship and to re-engage. But what did I say earlier? Forgiveness does not cure dysfunction. Sometimes there's still dysfunction and you just gotta keep on forgiving. Now, let me give you just a quick break-in moment here. There are actually some real concerns about a message like this in that there are certain relationships that are actually, they go beyond toxic and go beyond unhealth. They're actually dangerous. I'm not actually talking about those relationships today. Those types of relationships need professional help and they need really, really strong boundaries. So hopefully we as a church, our elders and our staff would love to help someone like that today. If, that, if you find yourself in an abusive or other kind of relationship, I'm not asking you just to forgive and re-engage. I'm asking you to actually come seek actual help and we will walk you through that. But today I'm talking about everybody else that has a friend, a family member, or if you're even sitting in this room, you need to be in community and learn how to forgive and to re-engage, all right? So, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter five, verses 12 through 15. I'm gonna read through this. I'm gonna set us up on some scripture to get us going. It says this, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, that means all of us, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Now, I love this sentence. Live in peace with each other. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. This message is to warn those of you who are idle and disruptive. Those are the people who don't forgive. You sit idle in unforgiveness and you're actually now disruptive. Have you ever met somebody that couldn't forgive and man, they are just a little bit toxic at the dining room table? All of a sudden you're like, let's get together for family pictures and somebody just, you're like, what just happened? Somebody forgot maybe the potato salad and everything just broke loose and you're not real sure why? It stems back to maybe some roots in their life that they, un they weren't forgiving people. Sometimes the weirdest, some of the silliest things can cause a massive rupture. Those are people, I need to warn you, that could be you. You are idle and disrupted because you're unwilling to forgive. Now, we wanna also encourage the disheartened because what'll happen if you're willing to unforgive? You get disheartened. You begin to walk away. I wanna encourage you today. It says to help the weak find their way. When you're by yourself, you are weak. When you do it alone, you are weak. We are designed to do this life together. And for us to all remember to be patient with everyone. What if we actually listened to what scripture said and said, you know what, I'm gonna be patient with everyone today. Wouldn't that just like revolutionize our workplaces? Could you imagine a waiter or waitress when every person comes in, their first thoughts were like, they're gonna be patient with the waiter or the waitress and vice versa? Remember one time I went to McDonald's and uh, I ordered a shake and the girl walked up, slammed it on the counter, some of the shake shot out and she goes, there. And I thought, well, she's having a bad day. <laughs> she was not very patient. Now, I just kind of smiled and knew she's probably having a bad day. I'm just gonna take it, thank you. But if somebody responded in kind, what happens? One person honks, cut me off. Now, I, I know none of you have ever done this. You ever ran up on somebody's bumper a little bit? Because you want to let them know, don't, don't do that to me. And then what happens to them? They get 
cut you off. And listen, what, what it is about losing patience with each other and we just like tick for tat and we just keep getting worse, like it just, it just keeps going, be patient with everyone. Don't pay back wrong for wrong. You have to learn to forgive. Always strive to do what's good for each other and for everyone else. That means you've got to re-engage in relationships. Guess what? If it didn't work, try again. Forgive, try again. Forgive, try again. So home alone, you ready? I need you first to understand that you all are like Kevin. You gotta be able to just see Kevin in your heart and realize I may have an eight-year-old Kevin in my life. I may be acting like a child. Do not look at your spouse. I'm just, a lot of first service issues, you know what I mean? He's eight years old. He's got older siblings from the beginning, though. We know that Kevin is kind of what parents would call a handful, okay? He's, a, he's got issues. Many of you were, had issues as kids. You were a handful, and some of you didn't grow out of it, okay? Some of you are still a handful today. You get a little selfish, needy, wishing you got more attention. Scripture talks about this. Proverbs 18.1 says this, an unfriendly person pursues selfish ends and against all sound judgment starts quarrels. Does that sound like you? This sounds a lot like Kevin. <laughs> now, <laughs> listen, clearly, first of all, many of you parents are like, oh, not in my house. Just let that sit. We're talking about something else right now. You know, not, we're not talking about parenting this morning. What we're talking about is Kevin's relational maturity is actually pretty low, isn't it? The way that he responds and acts and lashes out and does whatever he wants, his own behavior is already creating issues. How do you treat the people that are closest to you? Are you selfish? Do you want things the way that you want them to be done? Maybe you expect people to handle your emotional state at all times. However you feel, the house should just shift to understand and acknowledge the way that you are emotionally dealing with the day. Do you require everyone around you to do everything the way that you do it? You mow the yard the way I mow it? You cook the food the way that I would cook it? You vacuum the way that I vacuum you drive the way that I drive. Maybe you assume they actually know your love language. This happens every year at Christmas. They know exactly what I want. Did you tell them? No, but they will know. <laughs> like, don't, don't put yourself in that situation. That's just, that's just not good. Sometimes you have to tell people, I would like for you to hold my hand when we walk into a store. Sometimes you have to tell them, hey, I would love it if you would partner with me and help with me and sir, I'd love it if you'd just be quiet and sit in the living room. Do we tell our partner that's what we want? No, they should know. <laughs> Relational maturity is a little bit low. <laughs> Maybe you expect everybody to spend money the way that you want, to parent the way that you want, to eat at the restaurants that you want, to rest the way that you want to rest. Maybe you actually even want them to have faith the way that you have faith. A lot of couples experience this problem of like one person expects the other person to live out their faith the exact same way. And we put pressure on each other. It's just a re relationship maturity says we don't have to be the same. We can have grace for each other. When we live like Kevin, though, we begin to set ourselves up for conflict, right? Now, the first conflict that we really see is we, when we're dealing with the family, when it's dealing with our community, our relationships. That's the first conflict, and it is evident. Do you ever find yourself in conflict with your family? Everyone can say yes. That's fine. Everyone says yes. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. We are always in some kind of conflict, a misunderstanding, something small, sometimes something big. There's always some kind of conflict with your community, with your friends, with your neighbor. There can always be that conflict that's there. How you handle it is really important. Some of us may be just passive aggressive. You ever met people like that? They get upset, they don't forgive, so they're just super passive aggressive. They're just like, I'm just gonna be mad, but I'm not gonna tell them, and I'm just gonna huff and puff and expect them to know that I'm upset. Sometimes people that are that way, they will ramp it up a little bit. You ever like slam something in the house, just let everybody know? You drive a little bit faster and slam on the brakes because I'm mad and just everybody else needs to know it? That's usually what I do. I'm just kind of airing out my own grievances here. <laughs> you see, when things don't work the way that we want them to, we begin to verbally lash out. You see, it's not that we just get upset with our family. We can also do this in other relationships, in our communities. And here's what happens we actually start declaring lies over our situation. An eight-year-old kid is now saying he's going to never get married and he's gonna live alone. That's probably a bad thing for an eight-year-old to come up with and decide from that point on. All of us be like, that is a terrible idea. You're eight, you don't even know yet. But we do the same thing. 
We declare lies in our life. We say that, man, if I wasn't married, or if I was married, if my kids were like this, or if my coworkers were better to me like this, we create these lies in our life. Not only do we create lies, we listen to lies. You see in the movie, Old Man Marley, y'all know Old Man Marley, the guy with the snow shovel, clearing off the snow with the salt? He's gonna represent for this morning community. Even more specifically, I want him to represent connect groups in church. When he represents community and groups, we begin to believe lies that even other people speak about that. In this clip, Kevin is learning about Old Man Marley and how he should be scared of him. I feel like I have seen families literally do that in the lobby looking at the Connect Groups board. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not going to that stranger's house. I don't know what they did. But we begin to build up these lies and this thought process that keep us out of real community with people, right? Like, I don't know what your lie might be, but I'm sure you've believed something about, I'll never trust people. I never, never want to talk to that person. And like, ooh, they just look scared. They live in a bad part of town. I don't know if I ever want to go over there. We do this all the time. We believe those lies. We even perpetuate them and share them. That's probably been you. The idea of getting into a group with other people to have real community, mm-mm. They're lucky I show up at church. It could be, though, that you actually have wounds in your life that make lies like this easier to believe, right? Could it be that relationships can be scary sometimes? They can be nervous because you don't know what's gonna happen? And all that really does actually stem back to a moment where you got hurt, maybe in some kind of relationship, some kind of pain that you've just allowed unforgiven to just exist in your life. Like Kevin, you may have had similar experiences with friends or family that caused a wound, maybe even like this. You see, if we don't invite God into moments like that in our lives to get actual healing so that we can learn to forgive, the inevitable is gonna happen. We end up believing the lies, partner with the lies, and find ourselves removed from any kind of real relationship. And when that begins to happen, you actually start to believe. You know, I've, I've had more than one person tell me they hate people. I've had people say, you just can't trust people. And yet, from the very beginning, I told you, like, there is a really need and a deep desire for us to actually be in community with each other to have a family, to have friends and, and people in our lives. But if we begin to believe that I'll live alone forever and I can never trust community, they're always out to get you, you start to really believe these lies and all of a sudden you'll find yourself alone and you find yourself like removing yourself. You start literally uh, living out what you're speaking. Sadly, Kevin also believed the lies and here's how it plays out for him. I love how even in that moment, the realization of what he's saying, he's like, no, I wouldn't. I think it's because we all know we need family. We need relationships. We need them. That's why it hurts when we get hurt. That's why wounds from friends and family actually hurt because we want so bad to be in that community with them. First Thessalonians 5.15 says this. We're looking back. It says, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what's good for each other and for everyone else. Have you ever paid back a wrong for, the, for a wrong the way that Kevin's doing it here? He's using verbal sparring to get back at somebody. He's speaking out against them. That's how he's kind of getting back at them. Now, I know nobody has ever done this. You've never left a meeting where you were upset and played it over and over and over about how you would have said something to really get back at them. None of us would ever do that. Never play the scenarios of how, oh, I'd have really got them then and they'd have walked away crying sad and I would have won. But we do this on our own minds, don't we? And we speak that out and we live that. Oh, if I could, I'm gonna go back and tell them. And we verbally spar. It's as if we're going back and sucker punching them with our words just to run away again. Sadly, when this happens, we end up cursing ourselves and live out of relationships. You find yourself in a constant state of fight or flight, and it's this verbal sparring. And that's when we get into the next conflict. You've now dealt with and, and struggled in and lashed out, and you've made declarations, I'll never be in a relationship again. I'll never be with family again. I'll never, 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 never. And now all of a sudden, it shifts to the enemy has you right where he wants you. The second conflict, which always falls the first, is that the bad guys or the enemy has come to get you. The key here is don't get isolated. 
1 Peter 5, 8 says this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You see, the bad guys are Harry and Marv. And Harry, even before people were isolated, even before the homes were empty and vacant, Harry goes in deceive, deceitfully to check on them to see if people aren't there. And in the movie, what I always found interesting is these are two bad guys they are gonna rob the place. Why didn't they just rob the place whenever? Why not just wait till they were all asleep one night, sneak in and steal whatever they want? Or when they, maybe, you know, why not do that? It's because an isolated home is an easy target. But guess what? An isolated person is also an easy target. You cannot be isolated. Kevin is on a path of isolation, away from family, away from friends, away from community. Just the night before, right, Kevin is literally praying that he no longer has a family, speaking out against them, believing lies about community, and then all of a sudden he wakes up and nobody's there. We do this in our life, don't we? We verbally wish that we were all alone, that we didn't have to deal with all that drama and trauma and pain and all that other stuff. And then we wake up one day and realize, I don't have any friends. I don't have any people around me. My family doesn't want anything to do with me. I never was able to forgive them, and now I'm by myself. Here's the other part. We got there because it was dysfunctional. You, them, everybody was living in dysfunction. But again, remember, as we're talking about forgiveness, forgiveness does not cure dysfunction. Forgiveness is just another chance to get back into relationship and re-engage. Have you ever wished your family was different? You ever wished your friends were different? You ever wished it wasn't so difficult to be in relationships? You ever wish you had better communication, better love, better understanding? Guess what? Welcome to family life. It's hard. It's difficult. It's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect. The goal here is forgiveness. The words you say, the choices you make could isolate you. It may even come as a shock to you. It was a shock to Kevin. I think we have all been there. You ever had a bad day and you text somebody, called somebody, hoping somebody would show up? You're all by yourself and you're like, I think maybe I did this. I'm unwilling to actually engage to forgive. And guess what? When you're there... You're alone, you're isolated, you're by yourself, and all those 2,000 friends on Facebook, turns out they're probably not real. (laughs) And you're all by yourself, and now you're an easy target, and that's when the enemy shows up, is when we isolate. So now you found yourself alone, and the enemy, who's been prowling around like a roaring lion, has his eye on you, because you're all by yourself. An isolated person is an easy target for the enemy. Now, here's what you need to know. You can't fake community to get out of it. That may seem interesting to you, but like I just talked to you about social media or Facebook, right? We are getting really good in today's age of faking relationships. Really good. We keep everything at a distance. Just a quick text maybe or just a quick thing on Facebook, maybe a quick tweet or you follow other people or, or maybe even in passing, you do everything in a, in a bigger community context so that you never have to really engage with one particular person. Even family events, you never go just visit a family member. You have to make sure it's everyone's together, all the aunts and uncles to help protect and mask yourself from everyone else. Or maybe you bring a friend with you. We find ways of inventing and creating fake community to feel just a little bit safer. Right here, even Kevin is masking community to stay safe from the enemy. Yeah, so I mean, we create these fake communities. We try to live them out to like protect ourselves, right? Just like Kevin here, he's trying to stave off the enemy to show that, hey, hey, people are still here. We're all good. We're all safe. But it's not true. It's not true at all. At the end of the day, Kevin, who thought his family was dangerous and not safe and it's scary and all these things, and he thought about community and old man Marley, and we have all these fears we've built up in our life of what maybe real community or real relationships could look like because we're unwilling to forgive. We're unwilling to actually go and sit with them again, to give it a chance. Sometimes what needs to happen is you need to have like an actual moment with somebody, to sit and talk with somebody and realize, man, your family's not scary, Community isn't scary. It's actually something deep down that we were created to live in. You see, you have to get past your fears and begin to listen to each other. You may find out that others around you, even your own family, are even dealing with similar issues. Sometimes you just need to talk it out. 
Fear no longer has a hold on you once you have a real encounter. It's a pretty cool little encounter there. Kevin's actually meeting a connect group leader in a church. <laughs> you can say hi to me. You don't have to be afraid. <laughs> Sometimes we treat it like that, right? We treat family and friends like that. We're kind of afraid of them. We don't want to say hi. We never want to get around them. We just find ourselves distancing ourselves. And then I love this conversation, how he starts to realize he actually loves his family. He needs them, but it's complicated is what he says. We have complicated families. Some of you even have dysfunctional families. I'm not preaching a message that's going to cure that. What I'm telling you you need to do in your heart and in your life is learn how to forgive them so you can connect. Give yourself another shot. Give them another shot. Maybe, just maybe, your steps to freedom, your steps into forgiveness will give you guys a shot to come back together and have real relationship. You can't fight it. The relationships that you need. The wet bandits, the, they were afraid of the traps, right? Like all these things that are about to happen. No. They were actually afraid of the people. They're afraid of people being there, but with Kevin all alone, they knew we can get him. Remember, the bad guys, they realize that an isolated home is an easy target. The devil realizes an isolated person is an easy target. I know that you guys can make plans to try to protect yourself, to guard yourself. We stay home during the holidays. We take jobs that allow us to work from home or away from other people. We shy away from churches, connect groups. We shy away from anything that puts us into the public. We might even make plans to eat with someone, but we do it in public to make sure it doesn't get too deep. Kevin also had plans, but they seemed a bit childish. It'd be so much easier to live by yourself, isolated from community, not having to deal with family. And often you try to execute plans to keep yourself from having to deal with it, but the enemy is always right there. The enemy always finds a way. And your weak plans made in isolation are never enough. <laughs> you see, like Kevin, we just keep at it though, right? We keep dodging the enemy as best we can, running from room to room, trying to stay ahead of him. But ultimately, what left the enemy in the house is what's gonna keep you running. Isolation. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10 says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. What if we actually believed in this verse? When it came to family and community and relationships, what if we actually believed in this verse that two are better than one, that we should be together? that we should pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. That, at, that actually, that's where in Thessalonians we talked about like go help the brokenhearted when they're alone and have no one to help them up when they have been rejected by community and we know that they're isolated, that we should go and engage and lift them up, build them up, help them find someone. Maybe you today are hearing this verse and you're, you're trying to think of all the reasons why it's gotta be proven wrong, but what if you actually believed in what scripture has to say that two are better than one? If you believe this verse, You'd realize you can't do it alone at church, that you need to talk to your spouse. You need to sit with your parents and talk with them. You've got to talk with your neighbor and your coworkers and your church family because when life gets tough, instead of burying it deep down, running away, you actually deal with pain, the frustration, and you invite others in with you and you find ways to forgive. Maybe community and relationships are the very thing that will save you. Yeah, I feel bad now. Y'all, that's just gonna be ready. You're gonna be like, that's a group leader rescuing it. Yeah. <laughs> we had to forgive and engage because look, community rescued him. It wasn't his own traps and his own plans. It was literally community. Someone that he was afraid of early in the movie comes along and rescues him. Forgiveness doesn't fix dysfunction. It just brings you back into community. That he could have never been rescued by that old man Marley had it not been for their encounter at that church where they got real with each other and realized they don't have to be afraid of each other anymore. Matthew 18, I love this scripture, in 21 and 22, it says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times, Jesus answered. 
or up to seven times, it's a question. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Jewish tradition at the time would limit forgiveness to three times. Now, many of you are like, ooh, let's go back to that. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus has to say. The phrase 70 times seven, a better translation is unlimited. How many times should you forgive a brother or a sister? Jesus says, unlimited. Sometimes living out this verse may be one of the hardest things you ever have to do. Peter's question indicates he's still counting how many times he should have to forgive somebody because he's looking for a way out. You ever done that? I've already forgiven them. Ball's in their court. It doesn't sound like forgiveness is real. But we do this in our life, unforgiving, always thinking about what they've done and staying out of relationship with them. The lesson here is you gotta stop counting. Forgive. When they hurt you, do it again. Forgiveness is one of the most vital things to you being a Christ follower. What's amazing to me is so many of us call ourselves a Christian, yet we can't even do one of the most simple tenets of our faith, which is to forgive. What does that say about our belief in the one who forgave us? Scripture says we can forgive because he first forgave us. If we've never first been forgiven from Jesus, do we really know the one who forgave? Do we really have the ability to forgive if Jesus isn't in us and if Jesus is actually in you, can you not find some way in your life, even though you've been hurt time and time again, get on your face and pray and cry out to the Lord so that you can forgive them, so you can get back up and get into relationship so that they can hurt you again? Yes, sure. That's what we're called to do as Christ followers is be willing and be vulnerable to be in relationship with the world around us, with our family and the community that we need. And it's gonna require something of you to forgive. It doesn't fix the dysfunction. It just gives you a chance to live in it, in the community, in the family. What I'm saying is not that when you forgive, everything goes to normal. Your family, your community, your friends don't magically learn how to be perfect and know all your hurts and whims. You're forgiving them because it's what we do as a Christ follower. That's what we do. And again, when Jesus was dying on the cross, he said what? Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. He did not up on that cross saying, forgive him because he's the one that stabbed me and he's the one that hurt me and he said really mean things to me, but I forgive you. But we do this with every person, don't we? We wanna let them know our whole grievance list of all the things that they've done and at the very end say, and I forgive you. We just had to unload all of our emotional baggage on them. That's not what you do for forgiveness. You in the privacy of your own relationship with Jesus come to a place where you say, Lord, I forgive them. And then you turn around and begin to live differently. Forgiveness is more about you than it is about them. It gives us a chance to live in community. You see, Kevin was able to forgive and it allowed something beautiful to happen. Here's the deal. Family requires forgiveness. Friendship requires forgiveness. Community requires what? Yes. We have to learn how to forgive and to engage with them again. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Last part says this, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You can extend forgiveness because Jesus forgave you. We all need each other, and this requires us to learn forgiveness and how to re-engage with one another. So here's my challenge. Don't let this Christmas be wasted with you not living in forgiveness and engaging with those family members in your community. I want you to stand up this morning, and I'm going to pray over us that, man, when you leave this place, 
that you will learn how to forgive, that you will learn just that you need to re-engage with the people around you and the family. We're gonna have a prayer team back there at the back banner. If you need prayer for anything, for anything in your life that you need, if you need healing, if you just need some peace, if you need to just get better sleep, whatever it may be, we want to pray with you. But this year, let's be a church, let's be a people that learn how to forgive and extend that to our family and our friends. So Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to come and just worship in your house. We thank you, God, that your presence showed up today. God, we thank you for movies like this that we can just find even forgiveness and healing and all sorts of great, amazing things in them that, Lord, you are always speaking in every situation around us. And Lord, I pray that today, no matter where we're at, Lord, we would be able to forgive, that your spirit would move in our lives, that you would draw us into this healthy and whole place, God, where you help us to step into real forgiveness with our family, with our friends, God, that you would allow for us to break the lies and to believe what you have to say. And we believe all this in Jesus' name. Everyone says, amen. You guys have a great week.